right. Welcome, everybody. We'll let people get a little filtered in here. And I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Gail Darling, and I'm with the Middle Fork Willamette Watershed Council. Thank you so much for joining us and the North American Butterfly Association for our presentation this evening. We're so excited to have Tanya Harvey here to talk about the favorite plants of butterflies in the Western Cascades. Uh, before we start tonight, I do just want to go over a few housekeeping uh, items. We are recording this presentation, um, so you can check back on it. Um, share it with friends who you think might be interested, um, and we'll get that out to you in a couple days. Uh, you are muted and your video is off. You can ask questions at any point during this presentation, and we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box at the bottom. You'll see two little bubbles, uh, chat bubbles with Q&A underneath. If you click on that, a little box will open and you can enter your question there and just hit enter. Uh, that'll share those questions with us and we'll get those to Tanya throughout the presentation. Uh, we will also be sharing important links and info in the chat box throughout the presentation. So keep your eyes open for those. Um, and if you're someone who prefers not to see the chat, that's fine too. We'll be sharing that information um, at, in a follow-up email. So um, you can have the chat box open or not, whichever your preference is. Um, a little bit about us at the Watershed Council. We are a nonprofit operation, a nonprofit organization operating just outside of Eugene with a mission to work with communities for a healthy Middle Fork Willamette watershed through environmental education and habitat restoration. Our watershed stretches from Springfield all the way up to Waldo Lake and Diamond Peak, and we work with both private landowners like Tanya. We did a beautiful oak restoration project on her property and pub public agencies like the Forest Service and state parks. I want to acknowledge that our work in the Middle Fork watershed spans Kalkuyu, Malala, Klamath, and Tenaino lands. We want to recognize the reciprocal relationship of Native peoples in the watershed for their life-sustaining practices. We also want to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices that were forced upon them. And I just want to share a couple of Middle Fork related notes before we get started tonight, um, before I hand the mic off to Allison Center. Um, we are excited to announce that we have a new executive director, Dov Weinman, who will be joining us at the end of the month. We're very excited to have him on board. Uh, Dov most recently worked in the Sierra Nevada coordinating and facilitating, facilitating natural resource collaboratives with a focus on forest and watershed health. Um, he was born and raised in Eugene, so we're really happy to welcome him back home. And you'll be hearing from him more once he officially starts, but we just wanted to take a second tonight and welcome him here, and I'm uh, just so excited to have him on board. And then one last piece of housekeeping before we get started uh, with the talk tonight. Uh, it's time again for our annual board elections. So like everything else this year, they are virtual and I'll share a link in the chat in just a minute with how you can vote. Uh, you're el eligible to vote if you've attended a presentation or board meeting in the last six months, other than this one, unfortunately. So if you're eligible, we'd love for you to jump on and vote. Um, you can learn a little bit more about our board members um, and vote online. And if you'd like to learn more about the staff at the Middle Fork, our board, you can learn all that at our website, middleforkwillamette.org. So we are so pleased to be presenting this talk tonight along with the North American Butterfly Association. Um, just really quickly, if you'd like to see more free programming like this, please consider donating uh, to us and becoming a member of NABA. Um, any amount helps and will allow us to keep bringing these speakers into your living room. So. Enough from me. Thanks so much for coming tonight. And I'm going to hand things off to Allison Center, who's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the North American Butterfly Association and then introduce our speaker for tonight. And uh, let's just bring her up here. Hold on just one second. Okay. All right, Allison, I'll hand it off to you and bring up our slides. Okay, well, welcome. I'm Allison Center, and I have the joy and privilege to work in the Middle Fork watershed. I am a district wildlife biologist for the Forest Service. And also, I'm the president of the Oregon chapter of the North American Butterfly Association, or NABA. 
And so a little bit about NABA, it's a nonprofit organization focused on butterflies with a mission to educate people about the importance of conserving butterflies in their habitat. They, well, we all co conduct um, butterfly counts, the 4th of July counts, kind of based on the Christmas bird counts for Audubon. And some of these counts have been going for 25 to 30 years. And we're able to see trends. Different scientists have been looking at some of the count data over all these years and seeing what kinds of changes from climate change may be in butterfly populations and other trends. NAPA also offers butterfly garden certification and works to conserve rare and endangered species and has the National Butterfly Center in Mission, Texas which is down on the lower Rio Grande. And that's what you can see there up in the left-hand corner. Um, NAB also produces two magazines, Butterfly Gardener and American Butterflies that come out quarterly. And you can also see on the slide, the national website and also our chapter website. In Oregon, we have about six of the 4th of July counts that we do around the state annually. And we invite the public. Last year, we weren't able to do that, but usually we um, hope anyone who wants to come learn about butterflies or count butterflies with us will come on out. And we also lead several field trips every year. And we're hoping to be able to do that again this summer. And one participant in NABA for many years is Tanya Harvey. So I'd like to introduce her now. She is a local graphic designer, artist, photographer, and native plant expert. She created the Mountain Plants of the Western Cascades website, which includes reports on her frequent botanizing trips in the Western Cascades and a gallery of the region's butterflies. Tanya's the graphic designer and one of the editors of the three volume Flora of Oregon, which is a definitive source on the native plants of Oregon. And there's also a related website to that flora that you can check out and get plants identified on. Tanya has been a longtime participant in NABA Oregon projects and surveys and helped to find two unexpected butterflies in the Middle Fork Willamette watershed and those are the Sierra Nevada blues and monarch butterflies. And with that, I turn it over to Tanya. Oh, was I muted? Okay, just got to get this ready. This is my first virtual presentation, so you just have to give me a moment here. Um, okay, um, tonight we're going to look at the relationship between plants and butterflies. Um, my focus is on the western Cascades of Oregon but much of this still um, might still be useful to those who are from other areas because related butterflies often use other species of plants in the same family. And I also, I have to warn you that I've packed a lot of photographs and a lot of information on these slides. So since the talk is being recorded, you might wanna watch some of it later. Um, but if you wanna just take a screenshot of any particular slide or anything for your personal use, um, feel free to do that. It's a great way to just save stuff later um, for later to look at. Um, and another warning is that I live out in the boonies and don't have a very good connection. And we've noticed when we were practicing this that uh, there's often a lag time between when I switch the slides and when you actually um, see the next slide. So I'm gonna try to pause a little after each slide to give it a chance for um, it to show up on your computer. And each of you might have a different lag time, I don't know. It's kind of sad not seeing all the people here out here. I'm used to uh, seeing the faces in the crowd. Interesting talking to my own computer here. As you pro uh, all probably know, almost all butterflies eat plants in the caterpillar stage and most also nectar on flowers as adults. 
Caterpillars can be very particular about the plants they eat. So if you want to find them, you really have to know something about their host food plants. While adult butterflies are not as particular about nectar plants, it's also useful to know which flowers are most likely to attract them, especially if like me, you just want to um, photograph them a lot. So what I'm going to do tonight is uh, give you a, just an introduction to the major plant families uh, in the Western Cascades, and we'll look at uh, also at some of the best nectar plants. And if your interest lies more with butterflies than with plants, it may reassure you to know that if you learn to recognize the 20 or so families of caterpillar hose plants, you probably got all you really need to know. And we don't have to always know all the individual species too. If you can recognize the families, you'll be doing much better. Many of the best nectar plants are also in these same families. Uh, for instance, the ranger's button here on the left is the host food plant for the Anis uh, swallowtail caterpillar, but it's also a, a great nectar plant for many butterflies and also other insects. And on the right, we've got the uh, pearly everlasting, which is a, a nice nectar plant, and you can see the sulfur here is using it. It's also the host food plant for the American lady. And just to note also, just to make it easier to read all the names I put up here, um, I've got the butterfly names in orange and the plant names in green. Some butterfly uh, species are generalists, eating plants from many different families in their caterpillar stage. Others are very particular and sometimes they'll just use one family or one genus and even one species. And some of these are also the only ones to use a particular family. Being a picky eater myself, I'm going to start with some of the plants used by choosy butterflies. Um, and my, in particular, my favorite butterfly is the Clodius parnassian, which uses the dicentra, the um, bleeding heart here, as its sole host food plant. Um, there are some records, I think, of the little steer's head being used, but you can see it's a very small plant and it actually comes out right after snow melt and disappears very quickly. So even though a plant can be eaten by a butterfly, it doesn't mean it's, it's a very useful plant for them. Bleeding heart is very common in the mountains, often in open areas, including talus slopes, while in the uh, lower areas, it's usually in, in the forest. If you see lots of Parnassians around, you'll usually find bleeding heart nearby. Their caterpillars are dark, um, almost black, and they have little white dots on them, but I think I've only seen them a couple of times. They, they don't uh, show themselves very often. Interestingly, the other species of Parnassians that live elsewhere, one called the Phoebus, which I've seen down in California and in the Rockies, um, uh, eat sedums, our next family, and a totally different family. And you can see this, this uh, one of my absolute favorite photographs I've ever taken is this one on the on the left, I was leading a hike and we saw this beautiful, very fresh Parnassian, yellower than I've ever seen, um, must have just hatched and it let everybody watch it. Um, usually they're flying around and they're very hard to photograph, but this guy was, was excellent. You can see one of the reasons it's so special is that it has a trans or transparent wings and you can see right through to the flowers underneath them. Very elegant butterfly. Sedum species are very common in the Cascades. The broadleaf stone crop there with the very um, pale glaucous leaves is the most common one at lower elevations, and the creamy stone crop is the most common one at higher elevations. Oops, sorry. Mosses elephants are, uh, stay very close to their host food plants, the sedums, and they're usually found at lower elevations down here in the, in the valley and also in the lower mountains. And they're one of the very first butterflies to hatch in the spring. Right now, there are a few butterflies out um, that are overwintering butterflies. And so they, they come out as soon as there's a nice day, but not very many of them hatch out this soon when there's still cold conditions, like we just had hail about an hour ago. The caterpillars are really interesting because they can be different colors. Um, sometimes they're sort of reddish like this to match some of the red on the, on the, uh, the leaves of the sedum and, and at other times they're greenish. Um, and a lot of the, um, the mosses elephants are in a, a family called Lycinidae, which are the gossamer wings, blues and hair streaks and so on. And they all have these little slug-like caterpillars that have different colors and so on. They're very interesting little things and they're hard to find because they usually uh, hide in the flowers or under leaves. Milkweed is, of course, the host plant for the monarch butterfly. 
While most people are familiar with showy milkweed here in the valley, uh, Asclepias speciosa, heart leaf or purple milkweed is the only species found in the Western Cascades. And as Allison was mentioning, we didn't even know there was very much milkweed um, in the Middle Fork area in this watershed. Um, and it's the most northerly um, extent of its population. So we've been trying to find more plants of it and more, more meadows and rocky areas where it grows. Because just a few years ago, we discovered that, that monarchs were actually coming through and breeding on these. Um, it was very exciting because it only seen monarchs just a few times coming through. And then we found that they found all these little open areas where the milkweed grew and they were laying eggs and uh, breeding. And unfortunately, the last two years, the population dropped so much in the Western monarchs that we didn't see any. So it's been depressing. We finally found that they were using them and now they're not here anymore. But I'm still hoping that someday the monarchs will, uh, population will rebound and, and find these populations again. In the meantime, the, the uh, milkweed is a great nectar plant for lots of butterflies and other insects. On the left here, we've got the spreading dog bane, which is uh, not used by the butterflies. It has the same milky sap that, that uh, milkweed has, but I don't think there are any records of monarchs awesome. using it. But it's an excellent, excellent uh, nectar plant. And you'll see lots of pictures with that because I often photograph butterflies on the dog bane. It's very sad seeing the, uh, the, the, the monarchs are, are gone and we've got the milkweed um, sort of lonely with uh, just the other kinds of butterflies. But this is from a couple of years ago when I was going around looking for all these populations. And you can see the little tiny eggs, which are sometimes under the leaves, sometimes uh, on the seed capsules like there. And then they, they have these very tiny little caterpillars that start out and you can see that they start out with a little tiny hole in the leaf. Um, they eat their egg after they've hatched from it. That's the first thing they do. And then they start eating the, uh, the milkweed. And eventually they turn into these very, very large and, and handsome caterpillars. In contrast with monarchs who may migrate hundreds of miles, I've never seen a Sierra Nevada blue outside the wetland where its host plant grows, the uh, beautiful mountain shooting star. Um, often the shooting stars will grow in a small wet area in a larger meadow and the butterflies will still stay within that small space and not even go out into the drier areas of the meadow. I have no idea how they manage to colonize new areas. One of the interesting things as Allison mentioned that I just discovered that these were um, in the Calabria area which is part of the Western Cascades in the Middle Fork uh, area and uh, there are a bunch of wetlands up there and we just started noticing a few years ago that there were a few um, little populations in there of the Sierra Nevada blue. And we looked even farther north and didn't find any more, even though the, the uh, shooting star grows all the way up the Cascades into Washington and so on. So maybe, maybe they'll we'll start figuring out how to get to other wetlands. In the meantime, you just, if you wanna go see them, you have to go to the wetlands just as the shooting stars are, are fading. As with many blues, the sexes look different. The females are brown both above and below, while the males are a grayish blue, giving rise to the other common name, the gray blue. I just don't think that's as nice a name. The Sierra Nevada blue name comes from the fact that they're mostly found down in California. Um, there's also a, a much more common blue that you'll find in these same wetlands, and that's called the greenish blue, and it has the same little black dots on the, uh, I guess we can do this, um, on the, upper wings. Um, so they can be kind of confusing when you're trying to find the Sierra Nevada blue, but they have a much brighter blue and they use uh, clovers as their host food plant. We'll look at that later. The bistort here on the side that the male is nectaring on is a really, really excellent um, nectar plant and always seems to be in full bloom when the, these are on the wing, which is only for a few weeks maybe in the summer. Um, so anywhere you find the bistort and the, the dodecaffeine is a good place to look for the the Sierra Nevada blue. Some butterflies use conifers for their host food plants. Our cedar hair streaks eat incense cedar and others eat western red cedar. 
Um, and there are no records. We have a common juniper that's sort of a, a low growing shrub. I don't think there are any records for that. But on the east side of the Cascades, they do use the, uh, the juniper trees, the western juniper. The cedar hair streaks can be really abundant and often you'll see several on the same flower head. So I've taken oodles and oodles of pictures of these. They're quite beautiful. Um, the hair streaks are, are notable for having these little, um, little tails at the end of their wings and they often have these brightly colored patterning right there. And that's supposedly to uh, make a predator think that that's actually maybe the head. And you'll often see these little butterflies with the ends of their wings bitten off. So they're able to fly another day without the wing and uh, the, the ruse worked in that case. Uh, except for the Pacific yew, all our other conifers are in the pine family. There are many moths that eat conifers as well, and many of them use the pine family. And these are probably uh, moth caterpillars here um, down below. What's interesting about a lot of these caterpillars that use pines is they tend to have these little white lines, um, longitudinal white lines on the caterpillars, which match the stomata lines on the pine needles. So they're sort of protected and often they're green and white instead of these little black ones. I've never seen uh, the caterpillars of either a pine white or the pine elfin because they're probably way up in the conifers. Pine whites are ubiquitous in the late summer. They're one of our last butterflies to come out. And sometimes they'll have a big explosion of population. I've been out sometimes when there've been a, over a hundred of them, but they're sort of the sign, kind of a bittersweet sign that the summer is ending. The pine elephants are very uncommon over here anyway, in the Western Cascades. I don't see them too often. If you go over to Bend on the east side or somewhere down south where they have a lot more pine trees, um, you'll see these quite abundantly. Well, there are several species of butterflies in Oregon that use mistletoes as their host plant. Johnson's hair streaks are the only one I know of in the Western Cascades. Their caterpillars feed exclusively on conifer mistletoes. The mistletoe is found high in the trees where the only time I've actually seen them was when they've fallen down onto the ground. And I couldn't even find a photograph of that. Um, but it, it strikes me as rather odd that a butterfly would ever adapt to use some strange mistletoe way up in the tree that they usually wouldn't even be flying that high. Most of the butterflies tend to stay you know, on the lower side where there, there's more nectar plants. Some of them go like the pine whites or go high up into the trees. Another common family of trees is the oak family, of course. Um, and that includes both the Oregon white oak around here and the chinkapin. Chinkapins bloom in late summer, and that's when you usually see the golden hair streaks flying around them, nectaring in the flowers and rarely staying uh, straying far from the trees. They usually come out maybe in August, right when the, when the uh, trees are blooming. And what's really interesting is that the color, that golden color they have is almost exactly the same as the gold color on the underside of the chinkapins. And if you go further south into Oregon, they have different kinds of oaks, including uh, uh, canyon oaks, which very, very similar to this. They also have the orange underneath that golden color and they use those as well. So they're well hidden in there. If you ever want to find a golden hair streak, you just go out that time of year when they're flowering um, and you can smell where the trees are because they're pretty strong and just look for fluttering around the trees. And they, they seem to spend their entire life cycle um, pretty darn close to the trees. The California Sisters, a uh, beautiful, beautiful butterfly, but this one I took on um, out in our garden, actually, um, at the top right there. I've never seen them that blue. That must have been a very, very fresh one. They have beautiful coloring. Um, they apparently use both oaks and chinkapins, but I've heard that they use mostly chinkapins in our area. I'm not really sure because, again, I've never seen their caterpillars. The Perpertius duskywing, on the other hand, are very common in oak habitat. They just use the oaks, and anywhere you see a lot of oaks, you'll see dozens of these flying around certain times of year. Um, in addition to the duskywing, uh, lots and lots of moths uh, and other insects use oaks. So if you find a caterpillar, it's actually probably a moth and, and gonna be the duskywing. 
On the other hand, if you find a caterpillar and a violet, it's going to be a fritillary. No other species use violets, and all of our western cascade fritillaries only use violets. Early blue and baker's violets, um, the early blue here in this picture, um, are usually found out in meadows, but most of the other ones are found in the woods, and there are also a few species that you find out in wetlands. And the wetland ones, I suspect, probably aren't used because they're often inundated with water and so on, and that would not be very good for a caterpillar. The stream violet is easily recognizable by its branch stalks and grows in moist woods. Violets are used by all of the grape fritillaries and many of the lesser fritillaries. The meadow fritillary here on the right is what we call a, a lesser fritillary. They're a bit smaller and a different genus. This one is nectaring on that same beautiful uh, or well-loved bistort. It's not necessarily the most attractive flower, but it, it is beautiful to the butterflies. Some of the northern lesser fritillaries use things in the uh, ericaceous plants, a uh, heath family, where there's uh, up north. We'll, um, we'll see that a little bit later. There's a question about whether um, caterpillars ever eat non-native plants. And this uh, grape spangle fritillary caterpillar I found in my garden years ago was actually eating a really weedy violet called Viola riviniana. Um, which I will never get rid of, but I was happy to see the caterpillar on it. Um, but there's no way to know actually whether they survive well on it. Just because they eat something doesn't mean it, it won't be bad for them in the long run. So it's still good to have native um, plants. It's nice to know sometimes that they can adapt to non-natives in places where there's been a lot of disturbance. The great spangle fritillaries are, are sexually dimorphic and the males look a lot like this hydaspe on the, on the right. In fact, almost all the fritillaries to me look very similar and I have a hard time telling them apart. But the female has got this beautiful dark color and often kind of iridescent. And what's interesting is I almost always see them on mountain thistle. That's their favorite, favorite nectar plant. And maybe that's because that's in bloom when they're on the wing, I'm not sure. But uh, that's something where I look for the nectar plant in order to find the, the butterfly. Like the violet family, the mustard family is widely used by only one group of butterflies, the whites. The only other common family with four petals is the evening primrose family, which includes things like uh, um, fireweed and willow herb and clarkias. And I have seen many um, eggs and caterpillars and so on on the fireweed and so on, but I, I'm pretty sure those are just moths. I don't think any of our birds actually use those. The wallflowers here are beautiful fragrant um, flowers and they're a great nectar plant as well as being a possible host plant for some of these whites. Here are just a couple more of the uh, mustard family plants. Mustards contain distasteful oils called glucosinolates. The oils protect them from most predators. By adapting to be able to tolerate these chemicals, the whites can exploit plants that others uh, can't use or don't use. They're able to protect themselves by storing the oils in their bodies, which some of the species do. Elsewhere, they use other families that also produce mustard oils, like the closely related family Cleomaceae, um, which is found in Eastern Oregon. Only whites and marbles eat mustards. Sulfurs are in the same family as these, the, the yellowy ones, and, and they're creamy ones as well, but they eat legumes, so we'll see them later. Most people are familiar with the non-native cabbage whites. Uh, I think they grow all across the, or live all across the country, um, but you don't find them in the mountains, so I'm not including a picture. But they're found in the valley and uh, eat non-native cabbage and broccoli, which are also in the mustard family. So again, you know, learning that if you learn the families, you'll be able to recognize whites wherever you live. Oops. Whites often nectar on crucifers as well as using them for a host food plant. This female orange tip on the, on the right there, the, the male is the much brighter one with the white and the dark orange and females are a little more subtle in their coloring. Um, this one had laid several eggs on the rock grass. I walked it, watched it do that. And then when it was done, it went and it had a little drink from the flower. Uh, it's always seemed to me to be a really good evolutionary plan to uh, have the host food plant and the adult nectar plant be the same. And maybe that, that is how they um, discovered some of their host food plants. 
uh, in order to find the eggs, uh, you often have to uh, say, watch the butterflies and see where they land. And last year I saw a bunch of um, Western white eggs where the uh, Western white was flying around these very skinny eggs that some of them were white and some of them had turned orange, which was interesting. Penstemons and paintbrushes used to be part of the family Scrofulariaceae, but now they've been moved into these other two families, Penstemon and Plantagenaceae, the plantain family, and paintbrushes and Orobanchaceae, the broomrape family. Like the mustard family, many species in these two families contain chemicals that make them unpalatable to most animals, but the checker spots of the genus Euphodryas have adapted to use these iridoid glycosides to protect themselves. As their name implies, uh, implies the snowberry checker spot uses snowberry also, and that's in the honeysuckle family, Caprifoliaceae, which is a totally different family, but it also has the iridoids. Um, so the butterflies don't really care about what family things are in, they just care about the chemicals in there that they can use. We have many beautiful species of penstemons in the Cascades. Um, my favorite there is the, the pink cliff penstemon up on the upper right. And that's also in the Middle Fork area. There are lots of pictures because that's my favorite area in our watershed. Um, back when I was in high school in New England, I once found a penstemon covered with caterpillars at a nursery and we were able to bring that home. And I raised 22 Baltimore checker spots, which are the uh, related to these checker spots. They're also in the genus Euphodria. So even back then I had seen that connection. And of course the, the nursery people were happy to get rid of the plant that was already being chewed up. So that was kind of fun. I, I learned a lot about botany from the butterflies themselves. Uh, at least twice I've seen checker spot butterflies uh, eating um, Snow Queen, which is uh, blooming right now and is in the plantain family. It's not listed as a, a ho uh, host food plant for these butterflies, but they don't seem to care. As long as it's got the chemical in it, they'll find it. Um, checker spots can be difficult to tell apart. Uh, and snowberry checker spots have also been called variable checker spots. I can't remember if they were split or we just changed the name or something, but they are often quite variable too. So recognizing a checker spot is great. You don't have to necessarily know which one is which. Um, these two both use the same uh, food plants, which are these penstemons and, and uh, paintbrushes. The caterpillars advertise their distastefulness with their orange and black warning colors, and they also have these nasty looking spines. No doubt because these caterpillars have protection from predators, unlike most caterpillars, they actually can sit and eat out in the open. So they're easy to find, and I usually spot them and photograph them a number of times during the year. The chrysalis up there had, um, on the upper left had attached itself to a rock uh, right in the middle of a gravel road, which didn't seem to be a very safe place. But you notice that it has the same warning colors of orange and black. So even then they, they uh, advertise. And you'll notice these are gregarious when they're very young. I'll talk about that in a bit. Here you can see the, um, the Edis checker spot. It has what's called an Edis line um, right up here on the hind wing. It goes red, black, and red, and, and all the other ones just go red black, white, black, red, and so on. So very difficult to tell these apart and they have to sit still long enough for you to check out these things. I had thought that the valerian family was an exception to my theory that the host food plants and good nectar plants are in the same family. But then I found out that the caterpillar of the rare Taylor's checker spot, which is a subspecies of this Edith's checker spot, um, actually does use rosy plectritis as its host food plant even though there were no records of Edith's checker spot using rosy plectritis. But then just last year, I saw this, this caterpillar that's on the bottom there um, eating a rosy plectritis. So there, it, it's a lot of it is that people just haven't been able to record all the different plants that they use. So it's a good idea to always watch what uh, the caterpillars are on and uh, make a note of that because it might be new information for people. Um, so Gail, are there any questions or anything that anybody has yet?
Yeah, we do have a question here. Let me pop it open and read it so I get it right. <laughs> when the caterpillars are growing and host food sources run out, some caterpillars will be large, others much smaller. How mature do the caterpillars need to be to actually pupate? Uh, to pupate, um, a lot of them actually overwinter as caterpillars and they'll come out the next year. So um, I'm not sure, uh, you'd have to read some of the books and I'll show you the best book later for that. But a lot of them will just um, grow to a certain amount and then they'll overwinter um, as a caterpillar and then eat when the food is fresh in the spring. So um, uh, they most caterpillars go through uh, four or five instars, different stages. They start out little. When, they're, when they've eaten enough, their skin doesn't stretch enough, so they'll split and then they'll grow a bit and then they'll do that several times and different ones will, will take their, their uh, diapause or whatever in the, in, um, at a different stage. And once they get to the fourth or fifth stage, whatever in their species, then they're ready to, um, uh, to become a chrysalis. But if they run out of a food plant, they might, just, they might just go dormant early. I'm not sure. It's hard to spot that. I mean, these caterpillars you can see a lot, but a lot of the other ones you can't, so it's hard to say. But but checker spot, these checker spot caterpillars do overwinter as caterpillars. So they, when they're small, they they go dormant and then wait till the next spring. Any other questions? Well, that was the only one so far, but we can, if anyone has any questions right now, feel free to type it in that Q&A box or the chat box. Okay. Uh, give just a beat for that and see. Anybody comes up with anything? Um, oh, looks, we got one more here in the Q&A. Okay. Um, so there seem to be far fewer butterflies around than there were even just a few years ago. Um, and this person asking says they have a garden full of flowers that should attract them. Is this tending to be true? Yes, uh, it's really depressing. I remember seeing a movie years ago when I was young that was talking about how insects were going to take over the world. Um, but actually what's happening is that insect populations are dropping precipitously. And with them, the, uh, the birds and so on that eat them are also having problems. Um, and that's due to habitat loss, pesticides, all sorts of different things, just um, possibly climate change. It's uh, very depressing to lose the insects. You know, when you, I was younger, you'd drive around and the windshield would be plastered with dead insects, which was pretty awful, but now that just doesn't happen. There simply aren't as many butterflies or as many insects. So um, that's why we're trying to do whatever we can to, to do restoration and give them more habitat. And don't use pesticides and so on as possible to try to allow them to eat whatever they can and, and <laughs> survive. Anything else? That looks like it for now. So we'll keep an eye on that chat box and okay. Q&A and we'll uh, pop back in for questions in a little bit. Okay. Well, so most people uh, find it pretty easy to recognize the carrot family because we all eat carrots and parsley and lots of other things that are in this family. Um, but uh, the species themselves can be very difficult to tell apart. But as I was saying, um, if you're just new, if you're into butterflies and you're new in the plants, if you can just recognize the family, it's a good place to look for the Anna swallowtail. Um, it uses a number of different species uh, in the carrot family. And also um, the Anna swallowtail is part of what they call the black swallowtail group. And uh, all of them use uh, carrot family members. Um, when I was uh, younger again, like I said, in, in high school in, in New England, um, I used to raise black swallowtails uh, all the time and they, they would eat the parsley in the garden. So that was a really good source of food. If you're ever going to raise uh, butterflies, you have to be sure that you have plenty of their food source. You can't just bring a caterpillar home and, and uh, not have enough food for them. One of my favorite uh, in this family is the uh, ranger's buttons. This is a, a plant that grows pretty much up into our watershed here, the Middle Fork, and not a whole lot farther north. Um, it's a very strange and wonderful looking thing with these sort of buttons of uh, very tight flowers that the butterflies love. And it's also the a great host food plant um, for the, uh, the Anna Swallowtail. Um, a few years back, my friend Nancy and I were out uh, up at Groundhog Mountain, which is also in the Middle Fork watershed, where there's a really large um, wet meadow filled with these. And we found dozens and dozens of their caterpillars. It was really 
pretty wonderful. You can also see the bee is enjoying the pollen on the ranger's buttons. Many carrot family members are pungent, just like the, the uh, parsley, of course, and sometimes even poisonous to mammals. So this is likely what makes this caterpillar unpalatable and able to stay out in the open, kind of like the checker spots. Um, they don't have to worry. So you find these caterpillars fairly easily. The caterpillars molt several times, each time changing their look. At the first stages or instars, there's like this one on the bottom, the little one here, um, very small and looks a lot like a, a bird dropping. So it's sort of protected by camouflage. And then as they get older, these little spines disappear and they change colors. But they still always have that sort of um, uh, bright colored black and, and uh, orange or yellow warning colors to let predators know that they're probably poisonous. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the, uh, the swallowtail caterpillars is they have what's called an osmaterium, which is sort of a, a forked, um, orange forked thing that comes out of their head. And uh, it gives off an a unpleasant odor. Um, at least to other predators. I haven't actually smelled it myself, but I imagine that's they get that some of that odor from what they're eating. Um, and that repels the, the would-be attackers. The mallow family is another family that's really easy to recognize. Most people have probably seen hollyhocks in the garden and so on, but it's really hard to tell the different species apart. But again, the butterflies probably don't care about species. They're just more interested in the families. While the low elevation species of checker mallow often grow in meadows, the, in the Western Cascades, both of those species are, are mainly, uh, mainly found in wetlands. So that's a good place to uh, look for some of these butterflies. Uh, just this last year, I was very excited to finally see some gray hair streak caterpillars um, when I was trying to collect seeds of the rose checker mallow out in uh, near Oak Ridge, in the, again, in the Middle Fork area. Um, I was just looking for any seeds left and I saw a bunch of these little caterpillars just on the flowers and I had forgotten that they actually like to eat flowers. Um, but when the flowers are gone, as you can see, these are pretty much finished. Um, then they change over and they start eating the seed capsules but there were different colors. And again, the pink probably matches the, the flower. So while it looks very bright there, it's camouflage when it's actually eating the flower. The common checkered skipper is only uh, the only one of our species that actually uses the mallow family uh, exclusively. Um, the, the West Coast ladies use stinging nettle, which we'll see later, and painted ladies and gray hair streaks are very general. Of, um, they'll eat lots and lots of different families. The West Coast ladies I usually see um, to the south of here, um, where there are more wetlands with, um, with the checker mallows. And so here's the stinging nettle, which a lot of people think is weedy. I remember when I lived in Wisconsin, people were always talking about this was a very weedy plant, but I liked growing it because you could tell that, that insects were using it. Um, there are four species that really love uh, stinging nettle as a host food plant. I don't think anyone uses it a nectar plant, but it does have little tiny flowers. But anyway, if you, if you ever have any and, and think it's a nuisance, uh, leave it alone because it is a good host food plant for the, these four species including the Red Admiral, which I actually don't see very often. Last year we had a big year for them, or maybe it was the year before, um, but they're not around that often. The satyr commas or satyr angle wings, um, often I see in my garden because they, they eat other things as well as the, uh, um, the stinging nettle. They use willows as well. Um, and they're just, uh, all of the angle wings have these very marked um, edges on their wings, deep margins and so on. And they have this amazing uh, uh, camouflage on the underside that looks like bark, but they're brighter up above. And you can see the comma itself where, where they get the name, that, that nifty little C. There's even one back east called the question mark. The Milbert's tortoiseshell, I hardly ever get to see, and I'm not sure why, um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. And this one is nectaring on Monardella. Um, which is an excellent um, nectar plant. And if you find Monardella, that's where you're gonna find lots of butterflies. And that photo was also taken up in the Middle Fork area, um, in a burned area. The current family is one of my favorites, and there are a number of species in the Western Cascades. 
Um, I don't know I, why I haven't ever seen an aureus comma. I know uh, Laurie Humphreys has seen them sort of in the area around here. Um, and I, I finally, finally saw a tailed copper, which I'll show you. But the hoary commas are very common. And I, they must, the other two must use very specific species of ribes because the ribes are all very common in the Western Cascades. There's a lot of different kinds with wonderful different kinds of flowers. So I enjoy seeing them. They bloom quite early. But anyway, the hoary comet is the one that I see all the time. And this one, again, you see that the caterpillar has these spines and so on and bright coloration. And they hang out where you can find them fairly easily if you um, look for the ribes, especially the sticky current, um, with some chew marks. Just keep going uh, until you find a chew mark and look under the leaves. Uh, they're actually pretty common. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. Um, the spiny caterpillars of the hoary commas uh, are, uh, like I said, easy to find. And one year I was leading a hike up in uh, at Groundhog Mountain. And uh, I was telling people about how this plant is associated with this particular butterfly. And they had these nifty caterpillars. And the woman who happened to be standing next to the plant said, oh, you mean this? And there it was just on cue when I, when I was talking about it. And it was the same plant I had seen them on in uh, previous years in that area. So sometimes it seems like uh, some of these plants are, are generational um, using the same, uh, same plant. Uh, the uh, chrysalis there, I hardly ever get to see chrysalises, but I was down in the Rogue-Umpois Divide a few years back um, after a fire and all of the Trees had burned down and most of the shrubs were just coming back with a lot of fresh foliage and there were lots of caterpillars and this wonderful little uh, spiny chrysalis. Like other angle wings, the, the uh, hoary comma is camouflaged below, but quite striking above, very beautiful colors. I think what's supposed to happen is they're supposed to be camouflaged, and then if anything actually does find them, they open their wings and scare everything off by the sudden bright colors or something. I don't really know how that would work, but that's the theory. The tail copper on the, on the uh, left there, I just discovered a few years ago, I was bushwhacking to one of these rocky areas looking for some of the milkweed in the, in the Middle Fork area. And there wasn't much there and I was rather disappointed. There were lots of buckbrush, which is the, the little leafed plant that it's on. Um, but then I found the tail copper. So, you know, you never know what you're going to find. It may not be what you were, what you were looking for. And here's the actual, the buckthorn family where all the other Ceanothus are. They're very common in the Cascades. And what's interesting is that they're nitrogen fixing and they come back well after a fire and tolerate disturbance. So you see them in a lot of these uh, post burned areas and on roadsides as well. You can usually tell them because they have a, a sort of a three prong veining pattern here that's fairly distinctive. Not all of them show it, but most of them do. They're good host food plants for several butterflies and they also make a good nectar plant. Buckbrush um, is that little twiggy thing that grows more at the lower elevations in the mountains. This is in the Middle Fork area, um, one of the areas that has the milkweed in it, um, which is why I was there. And uh, lots of hedgerow hair streaks. And, I, and that same area where I bushwhacked and found the tail copper, I saw a whole bunch of these hedgerow hair streaks flying around and started watching them and realized that they were laying eggs. And you can see the top, here's this little egg. It looks like a little green sea urchin. Um, I would never have found the eggs had I not been watching the, the butterflies land, but that was a pretty exciting, pretty exciting day. California tortoise shells are known for having a boom bust cycle. They can be incredibly abundant for a few years, followed by several years where hardly ever a single one is found. And we just went through that where I, uh, there have been three years or so where I only saw one or two a year and a couple of years they've been back in large numbers. Um, and this particular uh, couple here were the most iridescent ones I've ever seen. I didn't even know they had iridescence. They're usually, as I say, they um, was mentioning before, these are the ones that are out right now. 
because they overwinter um, as adults and just hide under bark and so on. And they come out on warm, sunny days and they've been out uh, alive for months and they're usually pretty tattered. They also um, fly very long distances and so on. You'll see them up at the uh, Willamette Pass and so on, um, coming over the passes in just hordes of, of butterflies getting killed on the road and so on, because there's so many of them. Um, but they're a beautiful butterfly. Um, these are my favorite though, this, this picture, I've never seen them that beautiful. It's possible that the boom bus cycle is, is partly because of viruses, populations get too big. That's what I've heard. Um, but it also seems likely that their populations can boom back because they use the ceanothus, which after burns, which happen around here, um, just they can be enormous areas of ceanothus to uh, support these caterpillars. The Pesuvius dusky wing has only been recorded on that uh, snow brush that I showed in the first picture, but the pale swallowtails use not only ceanothus, but, um, getting that out of the way, uh, but um, plants in the rose family. And as a nectar plant, the lilies, you can see how much pollen is on that, <laughs> the swallowtail there. Uh, so sometimes they say butterflies are not great pollinators, but that one is obviously catching a lot of pollen. Um, you usually only see large butterflies like the swallowtails um, using lilies, but they do love them and will go from lily to lily um, seeking out nectar. The heath family or ericaceae is a pretty common one. Most people know rhododendrons and huckleberries and blueberries and so on. Um, again, sometimes it's very difficult to tell the different kinds of huckleberries um, apart. Uh, lots of moths use this family and a number of um, butterflies up north. Um, and some of our species use it, them as well. All of the ericaceous plants that are listed as butterfly food plants are, um, are shrubs. We do have things like pine drops and so on that, that are herbaceous, but they're not used by the butterflies. Mariposa coppers are our only species that use the ericaceous plants exclusively. The brown elephants here have a much more varied palate and they will eat lots of different families and are, are fairly common. They're usually a pretty drab looking butterfly, but this one was extremely fresh and actually had purple scaling all over it, which I don't think I'd ever seen before. Uh, some of those other butterflies I mentioned, the echo azures and the green commas that were on the list are also uh, generalists and use other different families. The sunflower family is one of the best families for nectar plants because it has these masses of tiny tubular flowers. And that's why it's called the, the composite family or composite flowers because there are lots of uh, little tiny flowers that are all uh, stuck together. And that's really great for butterflies because they don't have to use a lot of energy going from flower to flower like bees do. They're also a good host food plant for a number of different species. And one of the best ones is the Cascade Aster, which I illustrated here. Uh, people often send me photographs of, of composites to identify. And uh, what they often do is they'll take a photograph of some yellow daisy or dandelion looking thing right from the top. And they all kind of look alike from the top. So if you're trying to learn how to tell one composite from another, um, you really want to look at this thing called the involucre, which holds all the flowers in it. Uh, these are the ray florets, they're individual little flowers and disc florets on the inside. And the cascade aster has a very narrow involucre and it only has a few ray florets. But that's, that's the best one. Um, and it's the host food plant for the Hoffman's checker spot and the northern checker spot also uses uh, the cascade aster and some other asters and maybe goldenrod. And I'm sure some of you out here can tell the difference between a Hoffman's and a Northern, but I'm still not sure. These might be two Hoffman checker spots, male and female or something, but they are very similar and they use the same host food plants and you'll see them together a lot. Um, and what's interesting is I pointed out there were the uh, other checker spot caterpillars that use penstemons and paintbrush that um, they make these webby nests, uh, both at those species and these species in the late summer on, um, that's on Cascade Aster right there, where all the little tiny caterpillars stay together and 
because they have the webby nest and the little spines and they're together, they're just a lot safer. And then they overwinter as small caterpillars and the next spring they come out and then they'll grow separately. And I'm assuming that's because they couldn't, you couldn't have that many large caterpillars on the same plant without stripping the plant. So this is a, a good um, way for them to uh, not overdo their host food plant. Uh, the American lady there uh, is something I actually don't see very often. Um, they're supposed to use pearly everlasting and some of the other related plants to that, but that's a very common plant and I don't know why I don't see the, the butterflies themselves. There may be something else that, that limits their, their range. The field crescents also use uh, cascade aster, these ones on the upper right, but the mylitic crescent below and the painted ladies use thistles. And I was talking before about non-native plants being used. The, the mylitic crescents used to show up in my garden quite a bit. And I have a meadow that had a bunch of weedy thistles in it and I found caterpillars out there. So I think they were actually using the non-native thistles. So I had the dilemma of trying to decide, did I wanna get rid of the weeds or did I wanna um, save the butterflies? So I ended up leaving them for a while but they eventually um, died out. Uh, and there's the, uh, that dog vein again, that amazing nectar plant. The grass family is host for two major groups of butterflies, the satyrs, wood nymphs, and ringlets, and also the grass skippers. Um, and you can see below the uh, skipper caterpillars are not as attractive as the other caterpillars. They uh, have these big heads. Um, and this one is actually making itself a shelter. It's sort of um, uh, made a little webby thing to hold a milkweed leaf together to protect it. So they actually use plants for shelter as well as, as uh, food. Um, in in uh, our area, they pretty much use grasses and, uh, and sedges, but in other areas they use other monocots like bamboos, palms, and, and other things like that. In general, um, from what I've read anyway, the, the exact host food plant of many of these butterflies that uses grasses is, is unknown. Um, there are an awful lot of grasses out there, both weedy and, and native ones. And most of these butterflies are pretty common and so they're probably using a lot of different grasses. But there are some rare skippers that may be using just a very uh, one or two different species of grasses and that's why they're rare. So there's, there's still a lot to learn about host species for butterflies. Uh, great Arctics are really interesting because uh, a lot of the, most of our butterflies have uh, at least one, more than usually more than uh, more like two or something, um, breeds uh, broods. Sorry, a year. Um, so the the adults will um, lay eggs, and those will grow into adults and lay more eggs, and then some one of the generations will overwinter as a caterpillar or something. But the great arctics actually have a two-year cycle. So they uh, the caterpillars hatch out from eggs, and they spend the rest of the season eating food and then the next summer they spend the entire uh, summer also eating as a caterpillar and overwinter again as a caterpillar and they don't turn into an adult until the following year. So interestingly we have um, populations that are basically only show up on the even years. Um, they must have all started at the same time or something. So this is a, an odd year so we probably won't see a lot of arctics this year and other years they're much more common. The ringlets are pretty drab looking, um, but they, they're well protected in dead grass. I usually see them later on in the summer and they're just hanging around dead grass and, and uh, camouflage. This one, however, was done mock orange, which is just a, a well, most people, have, most people know, most people know, most people know mock orange. It's like nobody's business. Um, were there any other uh, questions coming up there? Gail, are we okay? Yeah, we, we have several, so uh, we we'll take a little break here. Okay, well, let's do another. All right, so the first one is, um, how much regional variation is there in host plants for species that are semi-specific? I uh, say so obviously some are host specific, but others are more generalist, especially for those that migrate into different types of habitats. How much do they vary host species? 
are those that favor legumes in Southern California, favoring legumes in the Western Cascades, for example? I think most of them seem to be, well, as I said, there are a lot of generalists that will use multiple families. So they probably use whatever is available. Um, but other ones that are very picky may use different, uh, like the milkweeds, uh, monarchs only use milkweeds, but they're probably using different milkweeds as they migrate and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're going to eat what's there. If it's, if it's the chemical, like I was showing you with the checker spots where they, they, uh, they like penstems and paintbrushes and so on, they're trying to get the chemical. So as long as they have something that has what they need in there or what they need to protect them, I think they're okay. But, you know, that would be, that would be interesting to track if, if a butterfly is actually moving, if they're changing. Certainly throughout the season, um, they might have to change also as if, you know, if it's a caterpillar for a long time, then their, their plant might, um, might change and they might move to a different plant. So that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. All right, we have another one here, uh, going one? back to the monarchs um, from a newbie. I am too, so right there along with you. Uh, I've read conflicting reports that monarchs fly the whole distance, and I've also read that they do their migration like a relay team with a baton, which is true. Um, well, what, from what I know, um, as they head north, they go through multiple generations. So they overwinter as adults in California, and, and, and then of course the eastern ones are similar, but then they will, they will go a certain distance and lay eggs. And those ones that will, let's say they lay eggs as they're coming up through Oregon, they'll lay the egg, and then those ones will hatch and they will continue going farther north. And so there is sort of a relay there. And then at some point, there's some signal that it's time to go back. And some of those ones, apparently will fly all the way back down to California once it's time to go. And uh, I, you know, Bob Pyle or someone else would be a person to ask those kinds of questions who really studied that. But um, uh, those ones will overwinter after they've gone on that long thing and then they will start going, but I don't think they would make it past the first relay. So the answer is, is yes to both. They do a relay in one direction and, and then in the other direction, um, and, I, and what we, one of the questions we had about the monarchs in our area is we're kind of in the middle between the Southern California and, you know, all the way up to Washington and so on. Um, we were wondering, we didn't get to track this because we didn't get to see very many monarchs here, but were they still going north or were they going back south or was that the end of those ones or, you know, it's hard to know whether, um, how far they would all go because we didn't have enough information, but lots of questions still to answer. And, and the Western population is not exactly the same as the, the ones in the East. Um, so, but there is a lot of literature out there that someone could find out more about that. Any other ones? Yeah, um, this one, uh, well, yeah, it might be kind of a big question, but what are the differences between a moth and a butterfly? And um, do they like the same plant species? Um, well, I did mention that there are some moths that use some of these same families, but I am not an entomologist. I am an amateur, uh, dedicated amateur botanist. So, and I've loved butterflies since I was a kid and raised them and so on, but I don't know that much about moths. They're definitely different. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of moths coming up, day flying moths, but most moths tend to be night flying. So it's a whole different thing being out looking for those. So... Um, there are a lot more species of moths than there are butterflies, um, and they're very difficult um, in many cases to tell. So I probably, that's one of the reasons butterflies are, are wonderful to study is they're few enough that you can actually kind of learn them, and, and there are lots of really showy ones. Moths tend to not be that showy because if they're going out at night, it's more about um, their sense that they, that they can uh, find each other and so on, um, rather than warning colors and stuff like that wouldn't do them much good at night. So you don't, um, whoops. Uh, I, I, you know, haven't studied them much, but I will show you a few day flying ones, which are more like butterflies. Um, we do actually have um, in, in Eugene, one of the moth experts of the world lives in Eugene. So there, there's, there are a lot of people around here who know a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> so I come from the plant, point of view. So I can answer more plant questions than the butterfly ones. 
Any other ones? Yeah, uh, this gets a little bit back to plants. Um, related to the first question, how much variation is there within a genus? Do different swallowtails use different hosts, for example? Well, like I was saying, the Anna swallowtail, I've seen it on many different plants, uh, many different species of plants. I, um, uh, I've seen it on little lomatiums and uh, you know small plants. I even had one in my garden once um, on a little lomation, and then on those giant rangers buttons. And so I don't. I think again, if it's got the chemicals that they need, that's what they care about. Um, you know, in some cases, like with the monarch and the the uh, the milkweed, um, they probably use the Asclepia speciosa more because it's more abundant and it grow it lasts longer. Our beautiful um, heartleaf milkweed grows in those rocky areas and it dries out really fast. So there's not a very long period that they're really edible, you know, juicy and stuff like that. Whereas the other uh, monarchs, uh, milkweeds last a lot longer. So I think in a lot of cases they will use whatever is probably fresh and, and, um, and so on. There may be some chemicals in some very specific species that, that would cause someone to be very picky. Um, yeah, I, uh, it depends on the butterfly. Some of them, as I say, use only a specific species and some of them will use anything that's around. Great. Um, this one, and we could maybe leave this to later if you want, but someone asked if you could talk a little bit about raising butterflies. If you want to answer okay, that we now. Can, why don't we talk about that at the end? Sure. Um, uh, we'll do that. Um, and yeah. then we do have a question and maybe also for the end, um, complimenting your amazing photographs and asking if you could talk Thank a little you. bit about how you took them and what gear you use. So maybe we'll leave that to okay. the end as well. My husband um, told me to bring my camera, put it up here, so I'll show you my camera. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can, talk, we can talk about that. Um, a lot okay. of people probably won't find that interesting, but um, anyway. All right, so I'll go through some more slides here. Perfect. Um, the willow family, again, is, is one of these families that um, everybody knows what a willow looks like, but nobody can tell one willow from another. <laughs> and in the, uh, to answer that question about, the, you know, whether they like different, different species of things, I'm not sure if anyone has talked about any of these butterflies that use willows liking a very specific willow. So um, willows do have some chemicals in them. Uh, I forgot what the thing is that they use for aspirin, but that can oh, salicyclic acid and so on. So it might be that, they're, that they don't care about which willow. But it, um, if you find willows in wetlands, that's a good place to look for so, some of these uh, different butterflies. So I showed you some of the other angle wings. The green comma, I think, is the best, has to get the prize for the best camouflage. Uh, not only does the underside look like bark, but it's got lichen growing on it. Um, just perfect representation. How, how anyone, uh, how evolution works that you can develop that, I, I have no idea, it's, it's uh, amazing to me. Um, this particular individual, the same one in both pictures there, um, was on my friend John's finger. Um, and it was just very friendly and let me take tons and tons of pictures. You can see it's, it's uh, drinking from his finger. I think in a lot of cases you think, oh, it, this is a friendly butterfly. It's actually using the sweat on your body to get some salts that it uses. Um, green commas, you don't see even nectaring that often. They're usually puddling um, to get minerals and stuff out of the, the soil. Uh, the uh, swallowtail there actually uses other things than willows, different, um, and the green comma as well will use some other trees like alders and, and maples and so on. But green commas, you'll, you'll find wherever you find willows and creeks and so on. The Lorquin's admirals are handsome butterflies that are often found defending their territory. At least that's my experience. Um, and I'll chase off other butterflies and then go back to their post on a, on a little conifer. Um, also in the Middle Fork area, there's a, a trail called Moon Point. And I swear every year when I go there, there's some little conifers growing by the trail and there'll be a Lorquin's admiral sitting on there and flying around. And, and again, it's like generations of them own that tree or something. Um, they, don't, they don't go very far beautiful butterfly. And what's interesting is that their caterpillars, those very strange looking caterpillar up there, um, was uh, uh, on a willow. And it looks, I don't know, just a really good camouflage as a bird dropping. It's got the white and the brown and the lumps and everything. You wouldn't know that was a caterpillar. 
Um, maybe a bird would, but I don't think so. The sylvan hair streak looks a lot like the gray hair streak, but um, it's found in, in, uh, in the willow area. So I usually see it in wetlands and I don't see it very often, but it's another cute little hair streak with the little tails and the, uh, the little uh, colorful edge on the, on the tail. And you can also see there's a little ant nectaring and this is that pearly everlasting that, that uh, I showed you as both a nectar plant and a host food plant. In the morning cloaks, I don't see that often, but I almost always see them early in the year. Uh, and they're almost always close to creeks uh, where willows grow. And I was down in the rogue Divide uh, several years in a row where I found the, the morning cloak on the exact same little sandbar in the middle of the creek that you had to cross on the trail. So uh, that was kind of fun. Um, and you can see willows also make a good nectar plant. They're um, out very early. They're blooming right now. And uh, it's one of the few things that's out that, that uh, insects can nectar on. So you can often find numerous flies and, and moths and butterflies and all sorts of uh, bees and things on willows. Um, and if you've ever been out to a wetland and seen what looks like just large scale stripping of, of leaves, it's probably done by morning cloak caterpillars. Um, I, I've been out several times where I've seen these just munching down all the, the uh, willows. And willows are usually, at least around here, fairly large shrubs, so they can take a whole bunch of large caterpillars at the same time. Um, and I even was out once where I saw um, what was left of their skins when they change, when they molt, they leave a little bit of dead skin behind. And it was just this gruesome thing of uh, almost dead looking plant covered with little dead skins. Um, but you know that there were a whole bunch of beautiful morning cloak butterflies that came out of that. Oh, and I just, oh, it's probably gonna take a second to go back. You notice that it has the same kind of warning colors, the, the, the spines and the orange uh, coloration on both the feet and the back. The knotweed family is an extremely important um, one for butterflies around here. Um, it includes docks, but in the Western Cascades, most docks are, are non-natives and in, uh, sorry, knotweeds, um, which are very common, but often in our area, they're little tiny annuals like this beautiful cascade knotweed at the, at the bottom, which is a, an endemic to the area, but they're very small and probably not the best host food plant, but buckwheats are, are just the best. Oh, and then the bistor, as I mentioned, I don't think there's any, any record of anyone using that as a host food plant, but as we've seen, it's a, an awesome nectar plant. Um, you can usually tell buckwheats by the uh, sort of beautiful white hairs. If you turn, turn over the leaf, you'll see white on the underside. And even the little seedlings that I'm growing in my restoration area, you can see that when they're tiny, have the white on the back. Lots of butterflies use the knotweed family. Um, all, of our, uh, all of them are the uh, gossamer wing sort, like I was mentioning in vicinity that, that are uh, the hair streaks and blues and so on, the little ones that have the multicolored um, slug-like caterpillars. And last year I was really excited. Um, there's a, an area near here called uh, Eagle's Rest, which is a fairly low elevation rocky spot um, but not that far from my house. And I went every week for a while um, collecting seeds and taking pictures of things. And uh, one day I came back with a bunch of seeds of the, the uh, Areogonum nudum, the uh, bare stem buckwheat there on the left. And uh, cause I'm growing that in my, in my restoration area. And I opened the little packet, dumped out all the seeds. And then I found that there was a little, a little caterpillar sitting inside the packet, which was really surprising. So the following week I went back and I started looking through all of the inflorescences of the, the uh, buckwheat. And I found probably seven, eight, nine more little caterpillars. Um, so that was very exciting. I had forgotten that they um, usually use the flowers rather than the leaves. Um, and what was really exciting is several of them had ants tending them. And as a child, I had this great book about um, English butterflies that I used to read. And uh, they were talking about ant tending of blues. The caterpillars have um, uh, exude a, a honeydew when they're, when they're petted or brushed or whatever you want to call it. And that uh, is something that's very tasty for the ants. And in return, the ants actually um, sort of protect the caterpillar from other predators, would-be predators. 
So when I found these ants, uh, I took a bunch of photographs and then I went and I looked for more, more uh, caterpillars and more seed and so on. And when I came back, the ants were still on that same caterpillar, even though it was on a different um, flower at that point. So it was uh, interesting to see they really were tending. Um, it's a, a very interesting uh, um, symbiotic relationship. So the other two butterflies that also use the areogonums, the um, blue coppers I don't see very often, and they're kind of hard to tell from a, a blue, except um, you can see it's got a lot of black veining on there, which is pretty. But the acme blues you see a lot, and if you can get a fresh one like this one, you can see what they call the scintilli, the, uh, the little um, metallic sparkles on the wings. Um, that, that's a, a good identifier for those that species. Beautiful little butterfly, and it's a net uh, nectaring on valerian, which we saw before um, with the rosy plectritis in the same family. So I, like I said, I haven't really seen any reference to um, the butterflies using the little annual knotweeds. You can see up in the right corner, that's a, a rather tatty looking uh, plant and it's very tiny, but it's not blooming. Uh, and it sure looks like that little butterfly is, is uh, ovipositing, laying eggs because its, it's uh, abdomen is actually curled into the plant. And you think, well, that's kind of a bad idea, but they often grow by the hundreds in these little ones. So it, it might be that that's actually a, a decent host food plant, but something to study and watch um, that I don't know about yet. Most people can probably tell members of the pea family from the distinctive flowers. We know clovers and lupins and stuff, even if we can't tell them apart. And uh, trying to tell a vetch from a deer vetch uh, or some of the other ones can be very difficult. But lots and lots and lots of butterflies, again, use the pea family. And many of our lysinids that don't use areogonums use the pea family. So here's the greenish blue that I was mentioning before um, that's often found in, in wetlands um, using, both of these are, are wetland clovers and it, it uh, prefers clover. Some of the other butterflies use different, um, different genera. Um, also the, uh, what's not in the Cascades, loco weeds, astragalus are really uh, abundant on the east side. And so east side butterflies will use that as well, but we only have two species in the Cascades. So I mentioned that um, before that the sulfurs use this family, the legumes, um, whereas the whites that they're closely related to use the mustards. But most of the others, there are a couple of skippers and most of the other ones are these little blues. And there are a lot of different um, uh, blues that, that are, they're, they're um, deciding our new species because they're using a very specific areogonum and most of those are in the high cascades, but some of them haven't even been named yet. They seem to be um, separating themselves as a species because they only use a different host food plant. So it's, I suppose it's kind of like um, how uh, different um, species uh, uh, become distinct because one of them grows on one side of a mountain, one of them grows on the other. And if they never breed together, then they eventually sort of separate as they evolve differently. And I think butterflies can sort of do that sometimes because their host food plants that they've chosen are different. And maybe they come out at a different time or something changes, but um, that's, that's beyond me. As I said, I'm not an entomologist. But one of the wonderful things about uh, photography is you see things that you don't see in person. When I was taking this photograph of the silvery blue, I didn't actually notice that there were little eggs in the picture um, right there on the flower. And up close, when I blow it up on my computer, they look just like the little hair streak I showed you before, the little green sea urchin, except these are bluish. So it was actually ovipositing in the flowers. And I probably was looking for eggs in the, on the leaves instead of on the flowers. In the Western Cascade, silver spotted skippers on the left there are supposed to use big deer vetch. Um, and both the butterflies uh, and the plants I usually see along roadsides. A lot of um, legumes are, are uh, nitrogen fixing and they tend to be pioneer species. So they come in after disturbance. So you tend to get lots of different things in the pea family along roadsides. 
which also makes them a, a good place to look for butterflies. And in fact, when I was out with Nava a few times in years past, all we do is walk up and down the roadside. So there's lots of good things to be seen that way you know, if you're not on a trail. The water balls here on the, on the lower right um, uses different kinds of lupins, but um, in the, in the Willamette Valley here, we have the Fender's blue butterfly, which is, is pretty famous for being uh, endangered. Um, and it only uses a specific kind of uh, lupin, which is the Kincaid's lupin, which is endangered um, because of uh, loss of habitat and so on um, in uh, developed areas at lower elevations here. Um, so that's a, not a great strategy for them, but it, it does show that, that how high they are to their host food plant. If the host food plants are um, abundant, then the, plant, the butterfly is not going to be rare. And I'm not sure how you tell the difference between a Boitevals and the, um, the Fender's Blue. They look pretty similar to me, uh, except that the, the Boitevals are, are up at higher elevations. The Anna's Blue is, is pretty common because they use a number of different things in the pea family. There's a lot of uh, taxonomic confusion surrounding these green hair streaks. We have about three species of these beautiful little um, kind of sea green uh, butterflies. And two of them use uh, the buckwheats that we had showed you in the, the previous family. And one of them uses this big deer vetch on the right. Um, and to the eye, there's really nothing different about the butterflies. So the way they identify them is what's growing around them. I guess they, they can do uh, dissections of their their sexual parts and stuff, that's something I don't want anything to do with, but um, if they really want to tell species apart or genetic work or something. But the best way to tell them apart is, is by what's growing nearby. So it really tells you if you want to look for a particular type of butterfly, you really need to learn at least the families of plants. So there, uh, the big deer vetch is pretty, it's a pretty large plant and it's pretty noticeable. Um, so if it's not growing around in a place, you'll, you'll, or if it is growing in a place, you will see it and you'll know it's there. Otherwise, you can probably assume that the green hair streak um, is either a Sheridan's or a Western green. This one I don't know because I, I don't remember what was growing nearby. The rose family, of course, is another very familiar plant uh, family with large and uh, large number of species and, and many different um, different shrubs and a few uh, herbaceous plants as well. And they can also be good nectar plants. As you can see, this ocean spray um, has a little anise blue nectaring on it. Um, it's mainly used by uh, generalists. And I suspect that that's uh, because they, they don't have any kind of chemical uh, in them, but I'm, I'm really not sure about that. Um, I'm not a chemist either, um, but here are some of the other shrubs that they're purported to use. The hard hack and, um, is pretty common and, and service berry is quite common. The two-banded checker skipper um, is limited to the rose family and they only use the herbaceous spe uh, species, none of the roses or any of the other shrubs. Um, so you'll usually see them near uh, uh, the potentillas, the, the cinquefoils I mean, and strawberries and so on. And I've even seen them nectaring on strawberries. Um, so since most of those other butterflies are, are general, that use the rose family are generalists, I thought I'd show you my, one of my favorite moths. Um, I mentioned that I was going to do some day flying moths. Uh, this one's called the sheep moth. And anytime you're out in the mountains um, where there are a bunch of roses, especially bitter cherry, there just seem to be lots of sheep moths flying around. And they're much bigger than the butterflies and they have a very, um, can't demonstrate it, but a very weak kind of flight, bouncing around and so on, but they can be very beautiful. They, they vary from orange and pink with a, um, a lot of black markings on them, quite bright. And you can see in this lower picture, even the, one of these butterflies, one of the checker spot butterflies thought that this was a, a, a butterfly and not a moth. They're kind of considered, uh, I think Bob Pyle calls them honorary butterflies or something. Um, and they, they have these extremely uh, spiny caterpillars. And I was once trying to take photograph, a photograph of one and I think I banged into it or something and they 
have formic acid in their spines. So it feels like a little ant bite, um, not pleasant at all. Um, and what's interesting about the picture on the lower, uh, lower left is that's a very unusual. I sent it around to some uh, real entomologists and they thought that was quite fascinating that a checker spot was actually trying to mate a moth. Um, and I thought that was sort of a once in a lifetime experience, but 10 years later, um, lightning struck twice and I, I saw this happening again with fritillaries going after a sheet moth while she was laying eggs. Um, that was pretty incredible. Anyway, look, look for these big moths when you're in any area with a bunch of uh, shrubby roses. So echo azures and, and uh, gray hair streaks are some of the most cosmopolitan butterflies because they um, will eat lots of different things, rose family and, and other families as well. Um, so they're, they're pretty darn common. Um, the caterpillar up on the upper left is one of the, you can tell it's one of those little gossamer wing caterpillars, but which one it is, I can't be sure, except it was on an ocean spray. And a lot of the other ones we saw were very specific, the ones on sedums, the ones on, on uh, legumes and so on. So that probably was the echo azure. So we're almost done, um, but I just wanted to show you uh, a bit more about the nectar plants. Um, there are a number of things we've seen, lots of different nectar plants in these host food plants, like the composites and the buckwheats and milkweed and so on. Um, but the, the way, the, the thing that the butterflies really like is having lots of close together flowers, like on this uh, blue head gilia here on the side. And also it's nice that they have a landing pad because unlike the sphinx moth on the, on the left there, um, they can't fly while they're, while they're drinking. So they need some place to land. Um, sphinx moths are also kind of honorary um, butterflies because they're day flying and they're very bright and beautiful. And here again, they love that um, dog bane. There are also a lot of bulbs that have, um, like onions, that have a, a lot of little flowers like that. And we saw the mock orange, which is a bigger flower, but I, I think they really like the fragrance um, as well. So the one family that, that is a great nectar family that doesn't seem to be a host food plant um, is the mint family. And possibly there's some place in the world they use mints or something, but they have a lot of tight flowers like this, um, little tubular flowers they like. And fritillaries especially, you can see there's actually, I think uh, six fritillaries on the horse mint there on the right. And the, the uh, uh, coyote mint is also, the monardella is just an excellent one. You see that along some of the areas to the south of here up in the, up in the Cascades, just um, dozens of butterflies attracted to it. But it has that mint, you know, as we all know, it has a, a strong mint scent to it. And I wonder if that repels the butterflies from eating it right now. No one's adapted to it. But then again, if they adapted to it, it might be like some of those other chemicals where it actually helps the butterfly. So maybe that's how evolution works. They'll nectar on it and eventually um, some butterfly species will learn to, to actually use mints. So that's, that's uh, the end of my talk. Um, I hope that when you go out in the mountains this summer, you'll, you'll look for caterpillars and you'll, you'll really think about when you see insects, what, what ones are, um, what plants are around and so on and, um, and have a really good time out there this summer. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the subject, about life cycles of butterflies and what they eat and what they look like when they're young, uh, this is the book to get. And I sent um, Gail a link, so hopefully she'll send that on an email. It's called Life Histories of Cascadia Butterflies by David James and David Nunnally. Um, David James at least lives up in Washington, but they are Northwesterners and um, have done a, just an amazing job. I, I probably can't see this, but they've photographed, they've raised all these different species and they've um, photographed the eggs and the caterpillars at every single stage and so on and talked about um, what they eat and how they spend the winter and that sort of thing. So it's a, an, an excellent book. So do we have any more questions? Um, yeah, just really quickly before we get to the two bigger uh, photography and, and raising <laughs> of butterflies, we do have a question right. about the um, phototoxins that the butterflies eat for protection and whether they work as an emetic, like in the case of the monarch, or do they kill their predators? 
I think mostly what I've what I've seen. Um, I don't know this again, not being an entomologist, but that um, there's a sort of classic picture of a uh, blue jays or something spitting out some some uh, insect that tastes bad. Um, if they take one bite of of a uh, an insect that has some chemical protection, they learn to not eat that again. And so a lot of these uh, butterflies have these warning colors to just say, I'm one of those. And you probably heard a lot about the mimicry that goes on, that the classic one is the, uh, um, oh God, I'm gonna forget the name there, uh, limonitis. Um, anyway, uh, it, it mimics a monarch. And so it, it's not actually poisonous, but the birds think it is. So there's a lot of back and forth there with evolution of, of things um, being poisonous and then other ones trying to pretend they are and so on. But it doesn't work if, they, if the bird or other uh, predatory insect doesn't know that you're, um, that you're poisonous. So they have the warning colors as well. Um, but I don't know if it, I don't think it kills anything. I think it just tastes bad and, and then they don't get bitten again. Sure. Perfect. And then we do have a question here about um, sharing contact info for our local moth expert. Um, and if you think that's okay, we can go ahead and include that in the in the follow up email. Yeah, I don't know if he's he's kind of a shy guy or something. But um, if you look up, if you look at some of the websites like Bug Guide, they talk about Hodges number one hundred and forty three or something, which is some species. Well, he's Hodges. He's D Hodges. So um, he used to be in our rock garden group. So I knew him from them, but I don't remember him ever going out to the other uh, um, groups or anything. But there, there is a, um, an entomological society and they, um, the Lepidoptera Society, they, they talk a lot about moths and so on. There's a lot of experts around and, and Allison would probably know those people better than I, um, uh, who to, you know, if you had questions, who to contact and so on. Um, okay. So yeah, we could, we could ask her or someone else in, the, in, the, in NABA might know better. For sure. Um, all right, so do you want to move on to the kind of um, bigger uh, Okay, well, I can, <laughs> I can show you my, my camera. I actually don't have, I mean, you can't see very well on these kinds of things. This one is falling apart. I just bought a new one. Um, the previous one, uh, this is a Panasonic um, FC uh, 1000, and I just bought the 2500. Um, uh, several of you who are watching know I was at... Um, in a bog and I fell in the water with this thing around my waist and that killed the first camera. So I just replaced it with the same one. But I've had several Panasonics and they're, this is not an SLR. I don't wanna get a really super expensive one um, because I, I do take it out and they get dusty and they get dropped and so on. So it's not super expensive, but it is a, a, a full zoom camera. So it goes, um, it's got a pretty long zoom. And what I do that's different than most people, instead of having um, uh, changeable lenses like you do with an SLR, all I have is I have this one close-up lens. And uh, it, what it does is it allows me to use my zoom. The zoom only, you have to be at least three feet away to, to zoom fully. And when you put this on, you can be about a foot and a half or so. And it, it uh, makes the size of what's in your frame much larger. So it's perfect for butterflies because you can get, you can usually get within a few feet of them, but not too close. There's a point at which butterflies will fly away unless they're, they're uh, um, mating or laying eggs or something else where they're very intent on what they're doing. So um, this is, for me, that's a necessity. And because it's, it's just screwed on, I take it off and on all day long. And I also, um, this one stopped working because uh, I had done it so many times I stripped the, the, uh, the threads on it, but it's really good for being able to just quickly take a picture of the butterfly or something as soon as it shows up and then go back to taking landscapes or, or whatever. Um, but I've really enjoyed the Panasonics. They work really well. And, and uh, like I said, it's not a, not a super expensive camera. Um, and the, the new one I got also has a, a very long zoom and just a, a little few more bells and whistles. And it's not falling apart. <laughs> Major plus. <laughs> yeah, that's when the rubber's falling off and dusty, and you know, um, I, I put put it through its paces there. Well, love, yeah. And then, yeah, this could probably be a whole presentation on its own, but I don't know if you want to say just a few words about raising butterflies. 
Well, um, what I can say is when I was in high school, I used to raise a lot of butterflies. We moved out to the country in, in Connecticut and we had a, a big spread and we had uh, milkweed and so on. So I raised monarchs and I raised um, anything I could find that we had a lot of food source. And when I moved here, I stopped doing that because I really didn't know uh, where to get, uh, where to find the caterpillars. M uh, monarchs are very easy to spot their caterpillar eggs for some reason, or their, the caterpillars and the eggs, like I was saying, and, and the checker spots but I don't have the food source. So I'm in my restoration, I'm working on getting some buckwheats and so on growing so that I'll have enough food that I could try it. So uh, it depends on what, you're, what you wanna raise, but um, different people have different ways of doing it. There's a, um, down in Elkton, they've been doing a lot of raising of, of um, butterflies, uh, monarchs specifically, and they were putting the little caterpillars and so on, uh, first the eggs and a leaf, just a single leaf in a little cup. And then they would just change the leaf out all the time. When I was young and I was doing it, I would actually get a much bigger piece because you have to have enough. Once the caterpillar gets big, they will eat a lot of plant and you have to be able to keep giving them new stuff. And the other thing is I would put it in a vase to keep it going for a while. And then you have to cover the top of the vase so the caterpillar doesn't fall into the water. So I did raise, try to raise a couple of those gray hair street caterpillars last summer and, um, it sort of went okay. I, I hatched out the most beautiful gray hair streak and it was late in the afternoon and I wanted him to warm up and get a chance to maybe fly. So I took him out into the meadow and he sat there for a while. And then he flew up into the air, just up and up and up about 30 feet. I was so proud, it was so exciting. And then two swallows just appeared <laughs> and that was the end of him, I think. So it's, it's a little scary when you when you raise them because suddenly they're your responsibility and I, I would hate to take something from the wild and then kill it. But um, I did just a couple to just to, to be able to watch the life cycle and so on. But again, if you if you uh, get that book, The Life Histories of Cascadia Butterflies, they don't talk so much about like how to put them in a container or anything, but they do talk about what they eat and, and, and uh, you know, how they how they brought them in. Sometimes they would actually catch uh, a live a female who's gravid, who's, who's uh, ready to lay eggs, and then they would get the eggs from the, the butterfly, which um, I, I certainly never tried to do that. But anyway, make sure if you do collect anything that you, you have a food source so that your poor little caterpillar doesn't starve. Any other questions? That was it. Yeah, those okay. are all the questions. And and if people think of more questions and, and have some, some burning questions that didn't get answered tonight, feel free to let us know and we can pass those on to Tanya and get those answered. Sure. And, and I said that the NABA, if you're interested in butterflies, uh, when we have meetings again or, uh, you know, in-person meetings and stuff, you can meet a lot of people who know a lot more about the butterflies. Um, and different aspects of butterflies. And, and uh, also Native Plant Society of Oregon, lots of, um, uh, lots of people who are knowledgeable about plants and so on. And I just wanna put one plug in for the book that we did, the um, uh, Flora of Oregon in our volume two, we have a special chapter in there on insects as ta plant taxonomist and uh, Jeff Miller, who I hope is watching, um, uh, wrote the chapter and we put in a lot of information about um, host food plants and there's an appendix in the back where you've got all of the butterflies in Oregon and all of their host food plants. So that's worth it and that might be like the first time that's been done in Oregon, but I just have my little thing about the Western Cascade. So Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for, for coming, even though I can't see any of you. It's very strange spending an hour talking at my computer and hoping someone's listening. <laughs> Anyway, um, thanks. Yeah, and thank you, Tanya. We, we really appreciate you doing this presentation and, and your photos are just magnificent and just bring this all to life and um, a view that I have never seen before. So I loved it. Okay. Um, and we want to thank you all for showing up tonight and sharing this last um, couple hours with us. And just as a reminder, we'll be sending you an email with a lot of the things we shared in the chat. Um, and some other information, including um, the book recommendations Tanya has and then the PDF summary sheet she's created um, for the plants. And then we'll also be sharing the recording of this video so you can go back and revisit it, share it with other people you think might like it. 
Um, and um, just a reminder, if you enjoyed this talk, we would love if you'd support the Middle Fork Land Watershed Council and become a member of NABA. They're a fantastic group with a local chapter and uh, we'll share that information in the email as well. Um, I just want to plug really quickly, the upcoming City Nature Challenge is happening um, at the end of April, um, and it's a local um, community science bio blitz with the goal of ob observing and identifying as many species as possible in urban communities using Thy Naturalist app. Um, so you can find information about that on our event page, but it seems like this might be a crowd that would enjoy participating in that. So um, you can learn more about it and how to use iNaturalist on our event page. So thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your evenings and we hope to see you soon. Thanks.